Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, first of all, happy Valentine's Day. What better way to celebrate Valentine's Day than with two talks on financial valuation? Very excited to be part of that. Um, my name is Dan Wong. I teach uh, the core strategy formulation class here at CBS, as well as technology strategy. And so glad to see some of you uh, here for this. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about something decidedly non-finance related, but has financial implications. Um, and it's about my research on startup performance and venture capital networks. Um, the reason why I'm interested in this is because it should not be lost on all of you that venture capital has a profound impact on the US economy. Um, the VCPE club, for example, is one of the largest student clubs here at CBS. But simply by looking at these numbers, you can tell that VC-backed firms tend to go public at higher rates than before. And in addition, they tend to generate much more value than before as well. And so this is something that's really important for us to pay attention to. Um, in fact, you know, this is called to attention by, in many ways, the recent uh, talk of the SNAP IPO. Um, and there's been a lot of talk, in part, about why this will create value in a different way for US markets. Um, there's actually been a lot of research on uh, the implications of getting VC funding for entrepreneurial performance. And a lot of it has been on the quantifiable aspects of this, so the financial benefits. And to sum up this research in just a very pithy phrase, and I know I'm generalizing here, um, it's that if you get more VC funding, then you tend to do better. And that should not be you know, that controversial here. Why? Because it gives you more runway as a founder, it allows you to experiment more, and to grow more at a faster rate. And so that's something that's significant. But any founder will tell you that getting VC funding also comes with non-financial benefits. And those non-financial benefits include mentorship, they include the ability to mobilize resources that a founder might not otherwise be able to do. In addition, there's this thing called monitoring, where they get this mon mentorship at regular intervals from VC funders. In fact, if you talk to a first-time founder, what they'll probably tell you is that one of the first uh, numbers they reach for when they have a question is the lead investor uh, on their, um, who's investing in their firm. The problem for us as researchers in studying this type of thing, however, is that unlike these financial benefits, like the total amount of funding that a startup receives, is that these kinds of things here are decidedly difficult to quantify. In addition, they're also really difficult to detect. I mean, how do you quantify something like mentorship? And so today's talk is kind of about looking at what the relationship between these non-financial benefits are and two kinds of startup performance. The first kind that I'll talk about today uh, is about exit outcomes. And so here I'm talking about whether startups who get funded by VCs tend to go IPO or be acquired, or perhaps they might go bankrupt as well. And the second thing uh, that I'll talk about, if we have time, um, is uh, their innovation performance. So these are for tech firms um, that are more likely, uh, that are more or less likely to release new products or um, develop new patents. Let me be a little bit more specific about what I mean um, by these non-financial benefits, because I'm going to talk about them in a fairly specialized way. So one of the things that we can quantify in terms of this mentorship is relationships. And here I'm talking about relationships between VCs among themselves, as well as between VCs and the startups that they invest in. So one kind of question that you can ask, for example, is which VCs that collectively fund a startup have all co-invested with one another before? And here I'm talking about the following situation. Let's say you have four VCs, and they're all funding the same startup, let's say, in the first round. But what we're trying to figure out with this study is if they've all co-invested with one another before, does that have anything to do with the probability of this startup going IPO, being acquired, or going bankrupt? And you know, long story short, we find that there is an impact on this type of activity. The second kind of question that you can ask is what happens with a VC that you have invest in another competitor? And you would think to yourself that, hey, that never happens. Well, it turns out it happens all the time. And here we're interested in this scenario, where if I'm this startup and I get funding from this VC, and that VC happens to invest in a different space, when the VC invests in a competitor in my space, what are the implications for my innovation performance in terms of patenting and new products? And so I'll talk about this second project uh, if we have time. But the first one is the one I want to focus on today. So those of you who are in my technology strategy class, uh, this next slide will be familiar to you because it's a quote that comes from the guest speaker from yesterday, not during the class, but in a conversation that we had years ago. Um, so um, one of my best friends, this guy named Jonathan Wagner, um, and he founded a company called TimeHop, which is a New York-based uh, um, tech company. It's in the social media space. And I asked him one time years ago, would you want to have VC investors who have co-invested with one another before? And his answer was, well, yeah, duh, because that means they work well together. Seems to make a lot of sense, right?
Well, then he gave it a little bit more thought, and he said, but if they care more about each other, they're not going to vote independently. So no, to avoid groupthink and teaming up against me, you know, he's decided that that's not a good idea. I feel that if our investors collude rather than compete with each other, they wouldn't give me a true market answer. So already, kind of intuitively, you see that the answer to this question is not obvious. So who are these people? Does anyone know? PayPal Mafia. And so these are people who have all had a hand in starting PayPal or investing in PayPal. Um, very successful company, later merged with um, eBay, for example. Um, and what all of these people later went on to do is that they had all, at some point with one another, co-invested with one another. And they were responsible for some of the biggest deals in kind of Silicon Valley history, such as YouTube, Uber. Um, these are all co-investors. They know each other very well. And that's kind of what they're known for. But the issue, however, is that in many ways, they are also known for, her, for having invested in a lot of misses as well. And the kind of rumor goes that the reason why these um, investors um, have invested in companies that have kind of missed the mark in a lot of ways is that they colluded to kind of guide these firms in such a way um, that they actually were off target because they actually didn't believe in them. Yeah? Why is one guy not Really good question. <laughs> I am totally prepared for this because that one guy is the owner of the restaurant they happen to be taking this photo in. He insisted on being in the photo. I tried to look up his name. I have no idea who he is, so that's why he's not labeled. Okay. The key question, getting back to the talk, however, is based on this knowledge of if you know which investors have co-invested with one another in the past, how does that information lead you to predict which startups are more likely to go IPO and which are more likely to be acquired? So there's a lot more in terms of the logic of answering this question, but let me give you a very simplified version of this kind of thing. So let's just take these two outcomes, becoming acquired as a startup and going in IPO as a startup. And already intuitively you see that different kinds of startups are funneled into these different outcomes based on their characteristics. So let's take a look at this acquisition exit. So based on like, our hunches of what we think would actually happen here, since no one's really taken a look at this type of phenomenon before, is that we think that if startups are invested, uh, have investors who have worked together a lot before, then this produces a higher likelihood of the startup being acquired. And it kind of makes sense when you think of the kind of firms that are more acquired. These are the kinds of firms that have developed deeper within industry expertise, within their segments. So that means they're engaging in, let's say, more incremental innovation. And as a result, um, they're more likely to be targets of acquisition by firms within their space that already have some knowledge of the potential synergies that could be produced from this acquisition. And in a way, you could say that these VCs, the reason, one of the outcomes of them having worked together a lot before is that they develop these shared mental templates that allow them to conduct these specialized searches for knowledge and information that allow the firms that they invest in to develop in this way. Now, if you look at just the opposite situation for IPO exits, you have different kinds of firms uh, that are more likely to go IPO. Specifically, these are the kinds of firms that tend to have broader market appeal. And for us, that means that if you have VCs that have never invested together, well, one drawback is obviously that they can't coordinate as well with one another. But one benefit is that they bring a broader sampling of market information and experiences that allow them essentially to um, basically uh, evaluate the firm that they're investing in in a broader way to assess whether it's better poised for an IPO exit. So this is kind of the crude logic that we're kind of going with here in terms of thinking about what prediction you can make based on knowledge of who who's invested with whom in the past in terms of these VCs. Now just to put a finer point on this, since these are just dots and hypothetical cases, there are real cases of this. So this is an example of two firms that come from the cloud storage um, uh, uh, um, uh, segment. Um, Gridiron uh, was a firm that had three initial first, first round investors, Moore, David Al, Trinity, and Foundation. And they invested $13 million in looks like two, 212, but it's 2012. And then Carbonite was a competing firm um, that was started a little bit earlier. And Carbonite uh, received funding from 3i, Converge, and Koretsu, six million, first round investment in 2012. And the difference between these two firms was that Gridiron's three first round investors had all co-invested extensively with one another before. And for Carbonite, none of their first round investors had ever co-invested with one another before. The result was that Gridiron was acquired by Violin Memory in 2013, and 
um, uh, Carbonite went IPO on NASDAQ. Obviously, I cherry-picked these examples to fit my argument. But what I want to illustrate here is that one kind of innovation that we came up with, um, my co-authors and I, was to find a way to qu quantify this type of relationship. And what we do is not just count the number of times, let's say, that Moore, David Al, and Trinity have invested with one another, but we actually go through each one of the deals that they've invested with one another to figure out the strength of that relationship between one of them. So the measure that we come up with for quantifying the amount of joint co-investment experience that they have is rather sophisticated. And that gets us a lot of variation and predictive power to try to understand the implications for these entrepreneurial exits. Now, this is obviously cherry-picked examples, but what really got us thinking about this question was in looking at just some basic summary data um, that I'll talk about in just a bit on what can predict, uh, what the difference is between uh, firms that are acquired and firms that eventually go IPO. So the first thing we kind of looked at is that we looked at, is there a difference between firms that are acquired versus firms that, are, that go public in terms of the number of initial investors they have? And so here I'm talking about these two um, columns. And you can see that there's actually not a huge difference between them. And I would think that, look, the firms that go IPO would have had more initial first round investors because they were able to attract much more attention. We actually don't see much evidence of that. So these are all VC-backed firms. However, what really got us was that when we looked within those investors, and we looked, uh, for example, at to what extent they had all co-invested before. And based on the measure that I just talked about, there's an enormous difference. For firms that eventually go public, they tend to have much lower joint co-investment experience among their VCs compared to firms that are acquired. So we think there's something here. So how do we actually look for evidence for something like this? Well, we used a public database that all of you right now have access to uh, called Crunchbase. It's the kind of data arm of the TechCrunch news magazine. And what we were able to do is we were able to um, kind of cull about um, uh, venture capital data on almost 11,000 uh, VC-backed startups in the United States. And from these data, we were able to determine um, um, that uh, about 3% of them go IPO, 15% of them are acquired, and the other kind of outcome that we're looking for is also um, whether they eventually go bankrupt as well. And so just this alone can tell you about the success probability of a lot of these uh, firms that we're studying. This is generally a fairly representative sample. This is probably, to my knowledge, having worked with a lot of this data before, probably the best uh, data on this type of thing. So all of you can replicate this analysis as well. Not that you would want to immediately after this talk. So here are the results of what we find. So the first kind of finding that we have is that if you have VCs that, uh, compare, that have very little experience, compared to those that have a lot of joint co-investment experience, having a lot more joint co-investment experience increases the probability that the startup becomes acquired slightly. It's not a huge effect, but it does increase the probability. But it has a much greater negative effect on the probability of going IPO. So it's much easier to interpret this in the reverse. So compared to having uh, VCs that have a lot of joint experience co-investing, those that have VCs that have never co-invested with one another have a higher chance of going IPO. So already you kind of see this risk and reward trade-off uh, when it comes to taking f money from VCs that have uh, worked with each other before and those that haven't. Now what's really interesting, however, is that if you look at this graph, you would think to yourself, oh, well, obviously the choice is to go here because um, if I, because you know, an acquisition premium is probably not that big compared to what an IPO premium would be. But the thing is, there's a third outcome that I mentioned as well. And that third outcome is the probability of going bankrupt. And here, the issue is that if you have more VCs that have more joint co-investment ex experience, although it lowers your probability of going IPO if you're a startup, it dramatically lowers your probability of going bankrupt. So again, this risk reward thing um, is appearing again. So just to kind of quantify this, what this means is that if you have a one standard deviation increase in this VC joint experience measure that we came up with, um, if you assume that the average IPO exit is worth about 150 million, you know, you can change your assumptions, you're 33% less likely to reach for an IPO exit, 
you're 6% more likely to um, go for this acquisition exit, and you're 54% less likely to go bankrupt or experience a closure. I've learned a long time ago never to do arithmetic in front of a group of finance and economics professionals, so I'm going to let you do the weighted average of all of this using your own uh, assumptions. But trust me, um, um, it, looks, it does help to quantify these trade-offs in terms of these values. Now, the one thing that you can say about this is that there's something fishing going on here. And I would completely agree with you, because you can't trust these results. Why? Because of three problems. The first problem is something called selection bias. And that means that we're only looking at firms that have received VC funding, and we're not considering what about these firms that never received VC funding but could have received VC funding? What about the factors that influence those firms? And so to address that concern, we use something called a Huckman sample selection model. It's complicated. I don't have time to go on with it. So let me go move on to the next problem, all right? Next problem is something called treatment bias. And here, this is a problem that says, hey, what if there's something about a startup that makes them more likely to get funding from VCs that have had a lot of joint co-investment experience compared to those who have not? And we're just missing that factor altogether. Also, a huge problem here. To deal with that, we use something uh, that's equally fancy called the inverse probability treatment weighting. Also, not enough time to discuss that here. The third thing the one that's more appealing to me and the one that's worth discussing here is how do we know that our logic is right? How do we know that our reasoning is right? And this is really interesting because if you follow my logic, what I'm saying is that the startups that receive funding from VCs that have never worked together uh, essentially are guided in a different way. They receive a different type of mentorship. They're kind of reaching for products and develop products that have broader market appeal. Now, it's impossible to actually go into every boardroom of VCs and actually witness uh, the discussions that go on. But one thing we can do is examine the traces of strategy of these startups. And one thing that we do find is that these startups that are funded by VCs that have less joint co-investment experience are also themselves much more likely to acquire other firms in different spaces. So in different spaces uh, outside of their own. So it does seem like our logic is consistent here that these VCs that have never worked together before are guiding their startups essentially to have broader market appeal. Again, there are many things that could be going on here, but we think we're right about this here. The implications, I think, of this study are fairly clear. And the first way of thinking about this is that the benefits of being funded by VCs that have a lot of experience working together are not obvious. We think it's a great thing because they can coordinate, they trust each other, but sometimes that trust might go against the entrepreneur. The second is that on the flip side, there's a lot of value in bringing together VCs that have never worked together before. And we often overlook that value because we focus on the first implication. And that kind of value has to do with the broader sampling of market information that might inform an exit decision that's potentially far more profitable. And the third, I think, is that if you look at you know, the kind of studies that we're doing here, they focus on all this non-financial information. And there's a big chunk of data that's available out there uh, for you um, as uh, individuals who are potentially going on to add value to investment firms to consider when making these types of predictions. So I think I have, do I have enough time to kind of finish? Okay, so I wanna take just three minutes to tell you about this other kind of study that we've done along a similar way. So the other kind of study that we're looking at here is just the opposite. So the question is, what happens if, what happens if I'm a startup and my investor invests in a competing startup? And you could say that this is a good thing or it could be a bad thing. But the thing is, it happens all the time. So this is a graph that comes from CB Insights, an email newsletter that's really interesting about um, um, VC investing in startups. And what it's showing you is the investors that have all um, invested, VC firms that have all invested in the ride sharing space. And what becomes apparent is that they're all investing in these different competitors. And so you would think that you would have different islands of investors investing in these different companies. But in fact, that's not the case. There's a lot of cross-investing uh, between investors. So how do we address this type of issue, and how do we actually determine what's going on? The study that we did um, about a year ago has to do with something called the minimally invasive, invasive medical devices industry. And here we looked at 175 VC-backed um, of these firms. And what the question we asked is, what happens when your VCs invest in a competitor? And in this space, the kind of competitors I'm talking about are those who are operating in the very same specialized sub-segment. So if you thought that minimally invasive medical devices was narrow enough as a sub-segment, well, there are even sub-segments in between uh, within this industry. And so this would be the case if a VC 
invested another, in another firm in the cardiology space, if I were in cardiology. And the results are fairly simple here. So we have this situation where I receive funding from a VC, and then the VC decides to invest in my competitor in the same space. What we find is that this leads to a 10% decrease in the amount of new product introductions and new patents that I put out in a given year. And the reasoning that we have is because, well, in many ways, these VCs are leaking knowledge from me to my competitor, withholding resources. It's almost this zero-sum game that the VC is playing. The thing is, it gets even worse if, for example, I were the first investment in the space and the second was my competitor. We call this the guinea pig effect. And it's even worse for me if my competitor receives more funding than me. We call that the teacher's pet effect. In that case, the competitor would be the teacher's pet. So in kind of taking these two studies together, um, the main takeaway that I want all of you to see here is that VCs tend to influence these startups in ways that have nothing to do with um, uh, kind of financial runway or very little to do with this kind of stuff. And with the data that we have coming out now, we can actually begin to explore the impact of these behavioral elements um, that influence financial performance. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, these are some papers. Thank you.